some of you may be disengaged. The path of the righteous man is beset on all sides by the inequities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil men. Now, blessed is he who, in the name of charity and goodwill, shepherds the weak through the valley of the darkness, for he is truly his brother's keeper and the finder of lost children. And I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger those who attempt to poison and destroy my brother. And you will know that I am the Lord. When I lay my vengeance upon thee, I got one thing to say. King Kong ain't got shit on me. Are you still disengaged? I like to think there's method in my madness. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> you see a fundamental divide between the manic mind and the asthmatic lung, as if those who experience mental health problems do so out of their own making, and as such, do not deserve the same kind of empathy we would ordinarily show to someone with another chronic condition like cancer, for example. And we see pink ribbons, ubiquitous. We see posters of women with fierce and mean expressions on their faces, together wanting to fight cancer. And I want to see those same posters of people wanting to fight together against mental health stigma. So how do we challenge stigma? Are we practicing anecdote-based medicine or evidence-based medicine? Well, the evidence is clear unequivocal data to prove, according to Professor Patrick Corrigan, world authority on stigma, that the most effective way of reducing discrimination is through social contact with someone who has lived experience. And we have a precedent. We know that coming out proud with homosexuality reduced the discrimination associated with it. A randomized controlled trial on the efficacy of coming out proud, published in the British Journal of Psychiatry, revealed that coming out proud reduced both self-stigma and public stigma. I had a cab driver in Norwich who said, oh, I'd never have one of them mad people in the back of the cab. I said, you better stop and let me out, love. <laughs> <laughs> there is no us and them. I know we're here to talk about mental illness, but in order to understand mental illness, we've got to start the dialogue about mental health. There are a lot of people who are mentally unhealthy without being mentally ill. And those people are frequently the people who fall between the cracks and end up mentally ill. When I had breast cancer, people wanted to come up and hug me. My my hospital room looked like the Chelsea Flower Show. Seriously, it was rammed full of flowers. I was strong, I was brave, I was courageous, all of those things. Yet when I was on a psych ward, nobody wanted to talk to me. My colleagues, other journalists didn't want to know. There were no flowers, there were no cards, there was embarrassment, no one could meet my eyes. So I suffered when I had mental health problems more than when I had breast cancer because there was no empathy, there was no sympathy, there was no camaraderie. Now let me talk to you about my life. Uh, I grew up in Preston, uh, third of four children. Uh, I had little or no money, but my, my parents taught me that you don't need money to have a loving household, you don't need money to have a clean household, you don't need money to have manners and respect. You also don't need money to work hard to try and achieve your goals. So having wanted to be a footballer all my life, since I've uh, watched my dad as a three, four, five year old on the local parks, I managed to attain a professional career myself. Firstly at Blackpool and then yo-yoing up and down the country, various clubs, various levels. I managed to win and lose at uh, the Millennium Stadium. I managed to win and lose at Wembley. Uh, I managed to play in the Premier League. I represented my country at under 21s, yet, I achieved all of this, a 16, 17 year, year career, battling with depression for some 12 years of it. And the biggest part of that, that really, like, it, it amazes me today, is that for 10 years, I didn't have a clue. You know, I've gone on a period, a journey of awareness of myself, of what mental health looks like for me, of what mental illness looks like for me. The most important thing was that I went on that journey with my wife. I went on that journey with my parents. 
I went on that journey with my siblings, with my children. We need to talk about this earlier. Just like this gentleman said, my, I was saying it before, my eight-year-old son came in with a nosebleed, instantly tilted his head a bit, pinched his nose. Dad, I've got a nosebleed. Because he knows that's what he has to do. But should he have an outburst of rage or anger and didn't know where it came from, or should he feel inappropriate in certain situations, he wouldn't think to talk to us about it unless we started the conversation first. That's where you sow the seed of information. That's how we break the cycle of ignorance. And it's how we start to re-educate the next generation so our leaders are making decisions that are informed about what goes on in our NHS system, especially when it comes to the parity between mental and physical we health. We talk about this because suicide rates amongst young men are exponentially on the rise and suicide is the biggest killer of men under 45 it's important to talk about this um, in terms of dementia, which is the biggest health crisis of the 21st century. And still, there's no proper care, there's no proper money put into research, and there's certainly no cure. Um, it's good to talk about it because it's all around us. And I just think the pressure on you now is even greater than it ever was on us. We had two young babies, two parents with all sorts of problems in Wales. And I was just breaking down myself. I used to sit there in the morning on national television, looking all happy and just feeling like shit, basically. If you'll excuse the expression, I was just falling apart. I had permanent shingles and no one was helping. No one was helping at all. Um, there was absolutely nothing for my mum, nothing, apart from antipsychotics and th with things which she should never have been prescribed. Um, one day I got a most awful phone call from social services saying there'd been an incident at my home and my dad at his wits end had actually beaten my mum up. Um, I still find that really hard to say. Um, I just think it's important to know that if you do have a mental health issue, you really are not alone and you really must press. So when I came to Cambridge, um, I was pretty horrified to realize that this was a place where people weren't really looking after their own mental health at all. I was running Invictus as well as doing my degree. I was doing the social media from Cambridge. And I realized that this is an institution that is often um, focused on a culture of burning out. We talk really proudly about the hours we've spent in the library, the all-nighters we've pulled, how exhausted we are, how ill we feel how we did this for this supervision or this for this lecture, and you're encouraged to do it. It's, you know, you're intelligent people and you're here and it's eight weeks, so you better work hard, you better work all night. But that's not healthy, and it doesn't help people. And I saw so many people who were self-destructing, and it's a Cambridge education, but it's not worth you know, your health. I spent a lot of my childhood running around the grounds of Free and Barnet Hospital, which is a very, very famous psychiatric hospital in London, which is now Flats. Um, but it was famous because it had this massively long white corridor that offered amazing acoustics to the distress that was coming out of the wards that came off it. I have to say the screams that I heard walking down that corridor have always stayed with me. Thankfully it was not to the ground, but nonetheless the lives of many, many people were destroyed in those hospitals. There was another man I worked with called Victor. Victor was a mixed race man, uh, half Chinese, half English, really intelligent. He got admitted, he did hear voices and he did have uh, auditory hallucinations, but he was admitted to hospital because he had the audacity to challenge his psychiatrist and say, I've read a bit of Freud and I'd quite like to have a bit of Freudian therapy. The psychiatry said, no, none of that, in you go. He then spent 40 years in, pri in prison. Absolutely, that's mm, Freud. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> when, when I met him, we decided we'd get you a bit of Freud. We'll get you a bit of Freud. And he had some Freudian therapy. Now, it didn't make him feel better in any way, shape, or form. But what it did do is it made him feel validated as a human being. And his gratitude, when I really kind of sit and think about it, still makes me weep today. Mental health has come so far. It really has. Those days of being with people who are tortured in that way through medication, I think they're nearly gone, dare I say it. I'm a bit scared because David might tell me otherwise in a minute. But, but I think we're nearly there. 
the very fact that you guys have suspended debating tonight, you are making the very changes that need to be made. And I'm really, I, I'm really bloody impressed and I feel really proud to be part of this evening. I hope it's going to be written down somewhere so that I can see my name in, you know. <laughs> Madness time. is part of my identity. Uh, I grew up seeing and hearing and believing and smelling and feeling things that weren't apparent to anybody else. And as a result of that, I spent half my life uh, as a psychiatric patient for 10 years. What did I do with the rest of my life? Um, I wasted it studying economics and statistics and writing economic models for the Treasury. <laughs> to this day, I'm still not sure which was the madder part of my life. <laughs> Um, this was a time when um, being an economist was still something that was seen as of, of high status. I now realise that my diagnosis of schizophrenia was merely preparing me for the stigma attached to being outed as an economist. <laughs> I remember uh, a lovely friend of mine, um, let's call her Angela, and Angela uh, still does, grew up hearing and seeing things and her voices would tell her she was disgusting, she was ugly, that everybody hated her, that if she went out she would be laughed at and spat at. Uh, and funnily enough, it was kind of true because she was known as the mad woman. And when she went out, people did treat her like that and that reinforced what her voices were telling her. We then discovered that she could actually negotiate with her voices. And if she said to her voices, uh, I can't deal with you now, I'm going to talk to you later, they would actually go away. And then we had a fantastic breakthrough, uh, which was absolutely nothing to do with psychiatry or genetics. Before that happened, someone invented these. Has anyone seen one of these fantastic things? Okay. Imagine the scene now. I can't deal with this now. I'll talk to you later. And all of a sudden, she's not mad at all. <laughs> she's just another annoying tosser on her mobile phone. <laughs> and there we go. All of a sudden, three quarters of the problems associated with her schizophrenia have disappeared. I hope you can be the kind of people that have it in your hearts and souls to help others if they need it. There is nothing better in the world than being there for somebody else. And by talking about your own madness, you are giving the opportunity to other people to help you. And they will value and treasure that for the rest of their lives. I'll quit while I'm ahead. Thank you.